Well, the only sport you guys care about, except for apparently F1. Um, the only fun team in football, the Miami Dolphins, head on the road as five-point favorites in Chicago. Crane, we'll talk about those Dolphins in a minute, but we must begin with the Bears, who sold on defense but added on offense at the trade deadline, acquiring Chase Claypool for the price of a second-round pick, forgetting the real-life implications like Claypool's upcoming need for a new contract. What does his acquisition mean for this Bears offense? Well, I think the real life implications here are pretty interesting, not in terms of the, the contract stuff, but just real football. Uh, Claypool, he has not been good in terms of fantasy. He's not been good in terms of like his receiving uh, efficiency. He's just a 16% target rate. He has a 6.5 yards per target, which is very bad. He has 1.03 yards per outrun, which is the lowest amongst the Steelers' main receivers and also a very poor mark. But like weirdly, he's drawing a lot of defensive attention. This year, he's been double teamed on 29% of his routes among wide receivers with 200 plus routes. He trails only DK Metcalf, Cooper Cup, CD Lamb, Devontae Adams, and Jamar Chase in double team rate. So I, I guess the defense thinks this guy's dangerous. So that could maybe open up some opportunity for Darnell Mooney. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe Cole Komet. I wouldn't be chancing Komet this week, I don't think, but I think maybe Mooney. The thing about Claypool is he has 0.94 yards per route run against double teams, which is terrible. So you can take Claypool away, and teams have been taking him away. But I do I do wonder if maybe this opens up the offense for Mooney, for Fields, and maybe generally, like maybe they're able to get the run game going a little bit more if you know teams are respecting the, the passing game more. I don't know. So that's I think a little bit interesting from like a real life perspective of how this this could help the Bears passing offense. I don't think. Claypool will be super interesting on the Bears. Yeah, just, I probably all four of us think this is a positive for Darnell Mooney, right? Where we know sometimes it can be kind of easy to galaxy brain, like, well, actually, this guy coming in is good and not bad because he's going to be commanding targets. But I mean, Darnell Mooney defenses weren't accounting for Equiminius St. Brown or Dante Pettis. Yeah. Like, this has to be good for Darnell Mooney. Right? Harry. Yeah, where there's someone the defense thing. actually has to account for, maybe he'll finally. Uh, have more space underneath and maybe some more space. Darnell Mooney can make big plays deep. Are we four for four? And this is good for Darnell Mooney. No. Oh, no, no. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, okay. It's such a small pie we're talking about, right? Like Darnell Mooney has a big chunk of the pie. What is going on in Chicago is my question. <laughs> um, and and uh, now, now Claypool comes in and maybe takes, takes some of the pie. All right. So, the, no, so, so Mooney goes hungry. I don't know. I just, I, I, I think that, it's probably not good for him. I Crane's argument is probably more convincing than mine, but uh well no, it is always such a fine line. Like, is this guy going to hurt this guy's target opportunity? Or maybe even if he decreases Darnell Mooney's target share a little bit, they're higher quality targets. It is kind of hard to like suss all that stuff out. Right. And I mean the Bears have been dropping back more. Uh, so maybe that's the overarching good thing for, for Darn Darnell. I think Mooney. it's good for Darnell Moon. I actually, I really do think it's good. I hope so. Kyle, I, I have him on a few Kyle, What do you think? Cause we're, we're disagreeing here. What do you think? I'm kind of with Denny. I like more targets to me more targets equals good and less targets equals bad. <laughs> <laughs> but what if he gets more targets? Cause uh, he's open more. Everything's yeah, bad? It's, it's possible. It's certainly possible, but your, your Claypool stats are like, he's actually not that good. Don't make me feel great about his ability to draw. <laughs> well, like yeah, he is being treated like Maple Tron. Yeah, the basically. defense thinks he could be a problem if they don't account for him. Did you call him Maple Tron? <laughs> Maple -tron. Wasn't that his old nickname? Remember? Oh, no, sorry. I don't remember. No. You guys, you guys honestly don't remember that. I, re I remember. It's from I the remember. great, the great North. Uh, that's that's Canada. If you don't know, um, it's, a, it's another country. You I just think you're the first person to make it. Just go to the the North America Wikipedia, read up on the other countries in this continent. And figure it out i'm talking about like alaska <laughs> yeah i am uh boy but canada wishes that was part of uh canada but we're america so it's a, it's american we'll just move on though denny uh khalil herbert encroaching ever further on david montgomery's turf uh the touches are almost even He's been, khalil herbert's been out producing montgomery on the ground three straight weeks montgomery Pretty sizable snap advantage soon. Just kind of what is the state of this backfield committee right now? Yeah, I mean, that that's the thing is that, you know, I, I thought that I would be able to tell a story where it's like, oh, Herbert has really eaten into Montgomery's snaps. Not the case, okay? Last week against Dallas, uh, Montgomery played 56 snaps to 22 snaps for Herbert. The thing is, though, 
if Herbert's in, he's getting the ball. He had 16 carries on 22 snaps, whereas Montgomery had 14 carries on his 56 snaps. Now, Herbert is not at all part of the of the passing game. Montgomery last week against Dallas ran a route on 20 of 31 dropbacks for Chicago. Herbert ran just three. Um, but over the past three games, the the, the efficiency difference re- really shows itself here. Over the past three games, um, Montgomery has played a lot more, has outtouched Herbert, but um, doesn't have that many more expected fantasy points. He has 33 expected fantasy points over that span, whereas Herbert has 27 expected fantasy points. So I, I think that Herbert has made it so that Montgomery doesn't have that like RB1 upside on a, in, in any given week. And Herbert can be played, I think, as a reasonable flex in in, uh, in deeper leagues. I, I, I will say that the Bears' predictable usage of Herbert, I, I feel like could come back to bite them and maybe him, but we'll see. I do have both inside the top 24 this week, and I don't feel overly great about that. But I think it's kind of it's kind of a six teams on by type of thing, which you might hear us saying a lot in yeah. the show. Um, but this both the floors feel fairly safe right now. And and we like like the touch floor a little more for David Montgomery, but Khalil Herbert's floor is high enough where I feel like you can place a little bet on his ceiling. And it's kind of like, do you want to play Michael Carter over these guys, Tyler Algier, AJ Dillon, maybe against the Lions? It's kind of a tough scene. So I do have both in the top 24 this week. Um, do with that information what you will. That makes sense. Kyle, in the other backfield, we don't have a committee with Raheem Mostert right now. But do we expect new addition Jeff Wilson, who, again, I thought his addition at first was a joke. To the Dolphins, I thought people were just joking on Twitter. And they actually did <laughs> acquire Jeff Wilson. Uh, will he remain mostly unchallenged, Raheem Mostert? Or do we expect more of a committee to develop as the Dolphins maybe say maybe try to protect a player the very extensive injury history in Raheem Mostert. Yeah, I would say based on how poorly Chase Edmonds playing, and I don't think Chase Edmonds is a bad running back, but I do think he was a poor fit for the scheme they were trying to run. There's growing evidence that he's also a bad running back. He, he might be, but he's been he's looked good in the sort of limited sample we've seen uh, previously in Arizona. He's looked like a decent runner. I'm just saying what we saw, I mean, what we saw with the Dolphins was maybe the worst running back in the league by efficiency. I believe he was dead last in rushing yards over expected per attempt. And Jeff Wilson actually grades really well in that metric. And it's not like the Chase Edmonds scheme changing thing is going to affect him. He's going from the same scheme to the same scheme. So no, it was hard to do less than what Chase Edmonds was doing. And his usage showed that in those final four games, final four games with the Dolphins, he had one game over five carries. So they weren't using him, and now they're getting a running back who's proven to be efficient in this context. I don't think it will be that much of a committee, but I, I do think Jeff Wilson will eat into the workload more than Chase Edmonds was doing. Before we move on from this game, does anyone have any new trends of the Dolphins passing attack, or is this just remaining Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddell, kind of an occasional Mike Jacecki pop-up game? Maybe Is Mike Jacecki kind of getting like the Dawson Knox zone at this point where no. very low floor but could score touchdowns in high-scoring offense? Crane is shaking his head no. No, his snaps were down and his routes were down last week. And you saw not just Durham Smythe getting some work, but Hunter Long mixing in as well. So they're, they're, he's down to a part-time player, kind of a, a touchdown dart throw, I think. Uh, as far as trends go, there was an interesting tweet from NFL Next Gen mentioning that um, that over the middle of the field completions – for uh, for quarterbacks that Tua Tagovailoa has 32 over the middle completions of 10 plus yards, 10 plus air yards, um, and that's twice as many as Tom Brady and Lamar Jackson and Joe Burrow, who are tied for second. So it's kind of yeah, it's it's been kind of interesting to think about like how this offense is schemed. You know that they're able to get Tua uh, throwing to Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle. Tyree Kill has 16 of these completions. Waddle has 15. Um, so it's it's pretty exciting, like the way they're kind of able to get these guys open over the middle of the field. Double teams have not been working to take these guys away. They're both just like super efficient, almost no matter almost no matter what the defense does. He's ripping holes in the heart of the defense. Uh, Mike McDaniel might be a good coach. Um, it's kind of what we're learning, I think. That is that is what I'm thinking, yeah. Well, Ty- Tyreek Hill said uh, a couple weeks ago, he said, this guy coaches like it's Madden. 
And uh, I think I think we're on to something there, folks. All we've ever wanted. <laughs> That's all I've ever wanted. This is it. This is the pinnacle. It only gets worse from here. It really does all go downhill. And it is going downhill for all 31 other NFL teams who just no longer score touchdowns. It's really, really right. quite depressing. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBC Sports and Rotoworld.com. Just want to thank you so much for watching what you just watched, or at least being too lazy to click out of it after the you know autoplay just kept it going. So either way, thank you so much for just letting it scroll by your screen. And now I'd like to ask you respectfully, 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 okay, respectfully, please subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel for the latest NFL news, fantasy headlines from Rotoworld, and betting analysis from NBC Sports Edge.